Good evening, everyone. We're going to reconvene from our closed session, and we have nothing to announce from closed session. So we'll go ahead and uh, close that out, and we'll call the regular meeting of the Elk Grove City Council Wednesday, October 23rd at 6.04. Uh, for those of you who are wondering where the mayor is, he should be here any minute. He's en route from the airport. But we thought rather than keep everybody waiting, we kind of at least get the preliminary stuff going here. Uh, Jason, could you read the Metro Replay statement? Thank you, Vice Mayor. This meeting of the Elk Grove City Council will be replayed on Metro Cable Channel 14 on Friday, October 25th at 1 p.m. and Sunday, October 27th at 9 a.m. It is being closed captioned. It will be webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. City Council meeting videos are also archived on the city's website at elkgrovecity.org. For members of the audience who may have personal electronic devices, please place them on silent mode during the meeting. Thank you. And the Elk Grove City Council welcomes and appreciates and encourages participation in the council meeting. The City Council requests that you limit your presentations to three minutes per person so that all present will have time to participate. The City Council reserves the right to reasonably limit the total time of public comment on any particular noticed agenda item as it may deem necessary. If you wish to address the council during the meeting, please complete a blue speaker slip that's in the back of the room and give it to Brenda, who's over here on our right by the gentleman in the camera, who's our assistant city clerk prior to consideration of the item. Jason, could you do roll call? For the roll call, Council Member Trigg. Here. Council Member Hume. Here. Council Member Cooper. Here. Vice Mayor Detrick. Here. And Mayor Davis is absent. Councilman Hume, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please address the flag. I pledge allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, we have a tradition of always uh, starting our meetings with a moment of silence, so would you uh, join me? Thank you. Next item, please. The item two, our approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? None. Next item. We have no items under closed session for section three, which takes us to section four, our presentations and announcements, starting with item 4.1, which is a presentation from the League of California Cities for the Helen Putnam Award for Excellence for Planning and Environmental Quality for the Elk Grove Rain Garden Plaza Project. How you doing, Charles? Uh, good evening, Vice Mayor Detrick and Council Members, City Manager Gill. Um, at this time, I'd like to please ask the Vice Mayor to come down and, and join me for this brief presentation. I think. You would, would you please. mind if we all came down? I no, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Can I sit up there then? I'm, uh, I'm Charles Anderson, Public Affairs Manager for the League of California Cities. Uh, I'll turn around and see if I can do it this way. Fix the audience here. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present to the City of Elk Grove the Helen Putnam Award for Excellence for Elk Grove's Innovative Rain Garden Plaza. Helen Putnam was a mother, school teacher, principal, mayor, and county supervisor. But most of all, Helen Putnam was a person who viewed meeting one's potential as the measure of success. Excellence to Helen Putnam was shown by someone who did his or her very best. She was as supportive and loving of the people who did their best as she was of the people who did the best. To the League of California Cities, Helen Putnam defined excellence. The award for excellence is given in her memory, established in 1982 by the League of California Cities 
the California City's Helen Putnam Award for Excellence program recognizes outstanding achievements by California's 482 cities. These winning cities have made unique contributions to community residents and businesses, contributions which have resulted in lower costs or more effective delivery of services. The purpose of the California City's Helen Putnam Award for Excellence program is to recognize and promote the outstanding efforts and innovative solutions by city governments to improve the quality of life in local communities, implement efficiencies in service delivery and operations, and to provide services responsible to the local community. This year, the Helen Putnam Award for Excellence was awarded to the City of Elk Grove for transforming a blighted one-acre parcel into an inspiring educational and recreational project that mimics a natural approach to retain and cleanse urban stormwater runoff while protecting the environment and promoting future sustainable practices. The Elk Grove Rain Garden Project demonstrates the connection between a small urban space and innovative stormwater management practices and is the first large-scale rain garden in California. The project provides a community gathering area where picnic tables, benches, and features an art sculpture for interactive play. Colorful interpretive signs help explain the functions of the project. With its water harvesting features, wildlife attracting plants, and fitness equipment, the project is connected to a quarter of residential homes, businesses, parks, and trails. The beautiful, inviting, open spaces inspire visitors of all ages to have fun as they learn easy ways to prevent stormwater pollution and preserve the environment for future generations. On behalf of the League of California Cities and the Helen Putnam Award for Excellence program, I'd like to congratulate the City of Elk Grove for the innovation and commitment to the environment and promoting future sustainable practices. Mr. Mayor, for any of you in the, in the audience that have not been there, the Rain Garden basically is right there, and it is uh, well worth the effort to go over there and check it out. It's a pretty cool space. Yeah, and I know uh, we all got to stand together to accept that award, but I want to really uh, just uh, applaud staff. I know it's a collective effort, uh, really an innovative idea uh, to be able to put that together, and, uh, and the fact that you know we're getting recognition from that only enables the you know, our community to learn from it and, uh, and those around us to learn from it. And so anyway, thanks to staff for your hard work. And Charles, uh, that was a, a great presentation. Uh, it was, it was uh, I have to say it was a lot better than the presentation that the League of Cities did when we went up there to originally get it. So that, to, to actually get the plaque in hand and everything was, uh, was pretty special tonight. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Excellent. We're going to move on to item 4.2, our next presentation. I understand we have the Young Marines uh, Drug Demand Reduction Program representatives here tonight, and they're going to make a presentation, and then we'll present them with a resolution. Good evening. Uh, my name is Young Marine Staff Sergeant Carolyn Edmiston, and to my left we have Young Marine Lance Corporal Robinette, and behind me is Young Marine Lance Corporal Carmen Moreno. We're in the Sacramento Young Marines, which is a national drug demand reduction program, the youth organization for the Marine Corps. We often get asked if we're training to be Marines, or if we're already enlisted in the Marine Corps, and questions of that nature. Some of us, including myself, may have the interest in joining the military after high school, but that's not our main focus. A few aspects we portray are discipline, leadership, and teamwork. 
but our main goal is to express the importance of drug demand reduction, or DDR. As leaders, we teach our fellow young Marines and peers what drugs are, their harmful effects, and how to live a happy, healthy life. It, even, um, it is even a requirement from the National Young Marine Headquarters that we spend at least one hour every quarter just learning about DDR and expressing to our peers what it is and the harmful effects. This time of year is significant to us because we are very close to Red Ribbon Week. My fellow young Marines will give you a few words about that. History of Kiki Camarena. Red Ribbon Week was established in the honor of Marine DA, Drug Enforcement Association, Officer Enrique Kiki Camarena. He made it, he made it his goal of life to make the world a cleaner, safer place. He is best known for his work in leading 450 Mexican soldiers to destroy over 2,500 acres of marijuana at a plant in Mexico worth over $8 billion. One of the drug lords was infuriated and got Kiki kidnapped, tortured, and murdered at the age of 37. Kiki's family and friends began handing red ribbons all over their hometowns until others joined in for remembrance. The red ribbon became a symbol of the demand to reduce illegal drugs. Red Ribbon Week continues his legacy by teaching both youth and adults to live happy, drug-free lives. My name is Young Marine Lance Corporal, and I'm going to talk about Red Ribbon Week and its importance. Red Ribbon Week is an alcohol, tobacco, and other drug and violent prevention awareness campaign observed annually in the last week of October in the United States. It started with Camarena Clubs in California, which sent a proclamation sent to the First Lady of the United States, Nancy Reagan, who initiated nationwide anti-drug programs. In 1988, the first Red Ribbon Week was issued to the First Family Partnership, proclaimed by the U.S. Congress and Chairman, Nancy Reagan. It's always a good time to express the importance of drug demand reduction, but Red Ribbon Week is the perfect time to show remembrance for Kiki Camarena, as well as educating others how to live clean, drug-free lives. Thank you. We thank you for your leadership uh, in a lot of different ways in our community, but certainly around the idea of promoting uh, uh, the avoidance of the use of drugs and uh, the fact that you're willing to step up in uniform and be an example to those around you uh, speaks volumes. So, you know, you all are well on your way and know that you're making a difference. So, um, we're going to present a proclamation to you uh, declaring uh, Red Ribbon Week the week of October 23rd through 31st of 2013. Uh, and just a couple of whereases, and, and uh, therefore it be resolved for you. So, uh, whereas communities across America have been plagued by numerous problems associated with illicit drugs and those that traffic them in, and whereas citizen support is one of the most effective tools in the effort to reduce the use of illegal drugs uh, in our communities, and combined with education and drug demand reduction, can f help foster a healthy, drug-free lifestyle. Whereas the Red Ribbon Week was Red Ribbon rather was chosen as a symbol commemorating the work of Enrique Kiki Camarena and represents the belief that one person can indeed make a difference. And whereas the Red Ribbon campaign was established by Congress in 1988 to encourage a drug-free lifestyle and involvement in drug prevention and reduction efforts. Now therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Elk Grove does hereby proclaim October 23rd through 31st, 2013 as Red Ribbon Week in the city of Elk Grove, and we encourage all citizens to join in this special observance by uh, wearing a red ribbon themselves uh, and showing their support for uh, a drug-free environment and really just lead by example, as you all are. Thank you very much.
Okay. Um, really want to applaud those young people. You know, it's uh, uh, the fact that they're willing to step up and take a stand and not only do that, but, you know, get out into the community and um, ask others to follow suit it makes a big difference. Peers talking to peers uh, really is the, is the right way to communicate. And, you know, there's a teen town hall meeting tomorrow night. For those of you that don't know about it, right here at 630, um, hopefully you'll encourage uh, folks to get out, attend, and participate in that. So we have uh, another, present, another series of presentations tonight. I have a feeling that's why a lot of you are here tonight. Um, uh, and that's the 2013 Mayor's Volunteer Awards. And this is uh, an award that's now in its third year. And, um, you know, it was created, this award in particular was created to recognize individuals, groups, businesses, agencies, and organizations whose volunteer activities directly benefit the Elk Grove community. Nominations are submitted by folks in the community uh, and reviewed by myself or whoever the, ma the mayor is in a given year, and also a selection committee that's comprised of city, other le local agencies, and community members. Um, one quick thing, you know, there are a lot of uh, awards that are given out uh, to recognize achievement within the city of Elk Grove. This one in particular is designed to really thank uh, people for volunteering, you know, I think what makes Elk Grove great and what helps us stand out is the fact that we have so many people that are willing to give their time and resources uh, to serve. And uh, by serving this community, uh, you're, you really are making a difference. You're building a stronger civic uh, uh, connectivity uh, and, and building up the community fabric that I like to talk about so much. So you all are that community fabric. So I thank everyone that's here tonight. Um, before we give out the awards, I'd like to um, first just thank my fellow members of the selection committee who had a very difficult time of uh, all the incredible nominees reaching conclusion uh, on, on which, uh, which nomina nominees to give the award to. Uh, Councilman Trigg, thank you for your participation and help in that process. Uh, Laura Brunson, our human resources manager, thank you. Uh, Chief Lehner was also part of the process. Uh, Steve Lee from Elk Grove Unified School District School Board. Is Steve here? Um, uh, Fred Bremerman from the Kasumas Community Services District. Fred, did you make it? All right. Sorry. Uh, Anna Bertolucci, New Star Energy. And uh, did Anna make it? Yes, Anna's here. Fantastic. And then also Mim Mimi Vega from the Running Zone. I know she wasn't going to be able to make it. Um, so the selection committee received several nominations for local service organizations, and. We had a little bit of a challenge because we were comparing organizations to individuals, and uh, that was a tough thing for the committee to grapple with. Um, and because uh, in some cases you had one person that has, has really gone above and beyond, and then you have organizations of people that have got, gone above and beyond, but the awards were all kind of uh, packaged together. And uh, so, really, what you know, what that did was as we deliberated and tried to figure out how we were going to you know, make a decision between an organization or an individual, it inspired a new category to be added to next year's awards, and uh, that's going to be a specific organization award. Because um, all these groups do outstanding work in our community uh, year-round, and uh, they really, truly seek nothing in uh, return for that hard work and, uh, and what they do. Um, so it was too hard to select a single winner. So what we decided to do tonight was that we're going to recognize all the deserving groups for their dedication and outstanding contributions. And the next year we'll be working on the criteria for uh, an award that, um, although it's not totally hashed out, we've, I think we've got some creative ideas for how to make it fun and interesting and, uh, and build up a good sense of camaraderie among the organizations within the community. But um, the first... Uh, group we would like to recognize tonight is Arlene Hine, PTO. And uh, I'd ask, ask you to just please come up as I read this, and then we'll uh, join you in just a moment. So please come up to the podium, the representatives from the Arlene Hine PTO. So this group was nominated by Jennifer Grace for their third annual multicultural fair. And um, the group held this event on September 20th and provided children and families the opportunity to learn more about different cultures. Um, Arlene Hine uh, is an extremely diverse community right in the middle of the East Franklin uh, community, and uh, I think it's pretty, pretty cool that you guys uh, decided to celebrate this explicitly. Um, but in addition to the event, I know that your members work year-round 
There's quite a group here tonight, too. <laughs> uh, members work year-round to provide school supplies and learning tools for Arlene Hines students, uh, and that uh, the district can no longer supply, including you raise funds, to, uh, I, I believe, for a library technician, right, to ensure that you're able, uh, students are able to access uh, a library tech. So if everyone could please join me in recognizing the Arlene Hine PTO, and I'm going to ask my colleagues to join us. Yeah, Guys, you gonna keep going back and forth all night, or stay down here with? Me? <laughs> so I, uh, this, you know, this this award has the mayor's title on it, but this truly is a City of Elk Grove award. So I, uh, you know, all of us on the council, uh, um, really appreciate the hard work of everyone that's uh, been serving the community. So let's do these together. Um, the next is the Elk Grove Alliance Club. I'd like to ask uh, you all to make your way on up, please. Uh, this organization was nominated by uh, Constance Conley for their selfless service to the community and other nonprofit organizations. Uh, last year alone, <laughs> if you've been to anything, anywhere, anytime in Elk Grove, you've seen these yellow vests with the purple trim. They are everywhere, um, literally. Last year alone, the club participated in over 70 local events. Their work with other local charities helped raise $13,000 in support of the Hurricane Sandy victims. Um, and I'm just pulling out a couple things because the list uh, of items that these, this organization was nominated for was like five pages long. Um, but whether it's barbecuing, preparing pancakes, or directing, directing traffic in a hot, dusty parking, parking lot, these members do, uh, do it all with service and enthusiasm. And they've got some really good pancakes, by the way. And they're make, they make them perfectly round. I don't know how you do it, but it's impressive. Um, so if everybody could please help join me in recognizing the Elk Grove Alliance Club.
All right. <laughs> I'd like to now ask the Elk, Elk Grove Optimist Club representatives to come forward. So this group was nominated by Eugene Murray and Sandy Waite, a Healthy Start nurse with Elk Grove Unified, for their back-to-school shopping spree at Kohl's, which is incredible. Um, So while we're congratulating him, this annual event was held on July 27th this year and provided more than 100 uh, disadvantaged local students with school supplies, new clothes, a pancake breakfast, and also haircuts to start the school year right. Uh, if you've never been out to this event, it's about 5.30 in the morning, I think, is when it yeah. starts, right? Uh, which means they're there at, what, 2? I don't know. But, uh, and literally, what, and there's, they coordinate it, but they're members of the community come together and they team up with kids and then they walk coals and they're able to get clothes for back to school, clothes, backpack supplies, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, they get a breakfast. There's all sorts of screenings and other things available. So it's really a great service to our community. But um, so you guys coordinate contributions and support from local businesses. I think eight other nonprofits participated in that event, uh, some of them that were also recognized tonight. Um, one of the things about Elk Grove and its commitment to service is that the groups work together so well. And, um, and so it, when you work together, you can achieve more. So this annual event celebrated its 20th anniversary this year. So we would, are grateful for your service and excited to be able to recognize you for that. How about a round of applause? All right, now I'd like to invite the Laguna Sunrise Rotary Club Interact up. Uh, this group was nominated by Angela Spees for their Interact Teen Rotary Club. More than 90 students with Franklin, Kasumas Oaks, and Laguna Creek High School <clears throat> are contributing their time and energy to support local events and other charitable organizations through this program. A couple of the accomplishments of the group, they um, started a vegetable garden this summer to provide produce for the Elk Grove Food Bank, and they've contributed to beautification projects, tutoring programs, and the clothes closet. These, clean, these teens are tall, for one. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, uh, they're, all, they're all like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> no wonder they work so hard. Uh, they clearly show a commitment to service in this community, really. So, uh, you know, you all, you know, this is a great connectivity. Right? You have the Rotary Club, and they've connected with the teens, and, and um, really you, you're providing leadership by example, and you guys are jumping right in, and, and by serving, you're becoming leaders in your own right, uh, and you are leaders in your own right. So we're excited to celebrate that tonight, to thank you and to recognize you. So please help me in recognizing and applauding the El El Laguna Sunrise Rotary Club Interact. Right. I'd now like to invite the Seroptimus International of Elk Grove to come on up, please. Just 
think sees candy, right? <laughs> you know, what I really appreciate is the, the crossover and the relationships uh, between these organizations. You know, service just runs in the blood in these families here. Uh, so this group was nominated by Tracy Edwards for their work supporting emancipated foster youth, the Elk Grove Police Department, and several local events. For years, members have provided trauma kits for children, crisis kits for assaulted women, and supplies supporting local women and children in the community. Uh, this year, the club is developing a new educational program for teen dating violence prevention. It's fantastic. Uh, the club stays true to its commitment to help girls to grow up strong and independent thinkers that enrich the community. Um, you're another group. Uh, everywhere I look, I see you, and uh, you're doing amazing things. So if everyone could please uh, help us celebrate uh, tonight the Seroptimist, Seroptimist International Velt Grove. Before we move off of the uh, organizations, I, um, I really want to, you know, I made a comment about how, you know, sometimes there's, you know, husband and wife and one's with one group, one's with the other. Uh, you know, I know that there are a lot of events that are done in the community and uh, each of these service clubs uh, that you uh, saw come up here tonight uh, invite others to participate. Um, and really, I mean, there's nothing in this for them other than the joy of helping other people. And so... Uh, I know they've joined with the city many times. You know, the Sandy Hook uh, uh, candlelight vigil that we uh, put on, a lot of folks came together for that. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, service is something to be celebrated. And, um, you know, I hinted at sort of ideas for how we might do this in the future. And, you know, we thought one idea we have is that we might do like a service cup. And we have one cup, and you all can compete for who gets it in a given year. So, <laughs> so more to come. Certainly would appreciate your input. I know that you all... Uh, serve, but you also have fun doing it, and so we want to find a way to be able to celebrate it. Um, so thank you again. Now, um, we had a, no a lot of nominations, uh, well, in every category, but uh, sometimes in addition to the nominees, we would like to uh, provide honorable mentions. And so in the youth uh, um, categories, uh, we have two honorable mentions we'd like to point out tonight and, and provide recognition for, and that's uh, Sh Shivani Parikh. And Connor Hassett, I'm going to ask you to come up together. Congratulations. All right, Shivani was nominated by her father, Bhavin Parikh, and despite her young age, she, ha she has a, a really long history of service, including uh, you should have seen the, the nomination packet. <laughs> it literally was about that thick. Uh, with press clips and everything. It's pretty impressive. Uh, so a lot of the things that she's done is fundraising for quake victims in Haiti during elementary school, and she founded several music, culture, cultural, and dance clubs in middle school. So she's been serving since a very young age, and you've got a long way to go. Um, she's a member of our city's youth commission, and some of her objectives include educating local youth about bullying, cultural issues, drug and alcohol prevention, and fighting against childhood obesity. Shivani has been recognized by several organizations for her service, including receipt of the President's Volunteer Service Award. And uh, for her continuing efforts to the Elk Grove community, we're going to recognize her, her tonight. Uh, Connor uh, Hassett was nominated by his aunt, Denise McKee. He's a re recent appointee to the city's Youth Commission, an active member of the Rotary Club of Laguna Sunrise, uh, Interact, uh, an active parishioner at his church, a five-year member of the Elk Grove Youth Lacrosse Club, and a board member for the Grants Advisory Board for Youth, Gabby. Uh, 
uh, for short. Connor is an outstanding student, an athlete, and a natural-born leader. Please help me in recognizing both Connor Hassett and also, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to make sure I get it right, Shivani Naomi Parikh. Thank you. All right, and now we get into the specific uh, categories uh, and the awards. So first is the Residents, Neighborhoods, and Community Groups category, and the winner is Dennis Williams. Dennis, could you come on up, please? So Dennis was nominated by his wife, Donna, for this award, and it's easy to see why. He coordinated a neighborhood watch committee in the East Franklin neighborhood uh, when traffic increased sharply due to the discontinuation of uh, school busing around Toby Johnson and uh, Franklin High School. Uh, Dennis met with his neighbors, school administrators, and city staff for nearly eight years to come up with a solution. And I know because I was in your, your uh, dining room, I think when I first got elected, uh, and we worked together, we came up with some solutions, thought we had it solved, but then you told me a couple years later it wasn't quite solved. Uh, and we got together again, you brought your you know, neighborhood leaders together, uh, and what a difference you've made in the East Franklin community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, much. so uh, in addition to those efforts, uh, Dennis has volunteered with our police department. He makes weekly visits to uh, Elk Grove Adult Care Facilities with his dog as part of a pet therapy program called Lend a Heart, Lend a Hand. Is, is she here tonight? Yeah, uh, my dog. Yeah. Well, okay, all right. No, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, Dennis, uh, you uh, are an outstanding community leader, so we thank you for your service, and we're pleased to provide this award and recognize your efforts tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Miss Teresa Rodriguez. Get, get on up here. All right. Um, so Teresa was my nomination, um, and you know, according to my my own words in that nomination, you know, you are a volunteer rock star. Uh, truly, I don't think there is uh, uh, an event uh, or organization within the community of Elk Grove that you haven't been a part of at some point in time. Um, I know that you for, certainly started off with um, the Relay for Life and doing the fundraising for Relay for Life, and I think you've set you know, fundraising records there that they still haven't beat. <laughs> uh, got uh, Councilman Hume and I to shave our heads. Um, his, grew, his grew back, mine hasn't. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, she's the incoming uh, president of the Elk Grove Lions Club, right, uh, next year. And I guess I would just say generally, you know, I mean, you've been a, a, a key volunteer in, in working with the Grace House, which is the, you know, first Elk Grove transitional home. Um, y- you know, you really are the one that has made the Elk Grove Youth Sports Foundation such a, such a success. Um, and if you need something done in Elk Grove, Teresa's the one to call. So it's uh, a pleasure for us to be able to recognize Teresa for her hard work. Uh, as a volunteer for everything that you do for Elk Grove. Thank you.
Okay, the next category is arts, culture, and heritage. And by the way, Teresa's uh, category was social and community service. Uh, so for arts, culture, and heritage, our winner tonight is D. Uh, Chisita. Uh, D was nominated by her friend Judy Knott, who unfortunately uh, couldn't be with us tonight, but um, to see you. Congratulations. D is a dedicated local artist who has gone out of her way to promote the arts in Elk Grove. Uh, as a member of the Elk Grove Artists, she's chaired the Art to Hang program and the annual high school art contest. Both of those projects require hundreds of hours in coordination time. Right? Um, and as Judy stated in her nomination, D is the epitome of a dedicated volunteer and someone who believes strongly in art as a way of life. And for those of you that uh, have been involved in the arts and part of the arts, know that it can be a transformative tool in, in people's lives. And so uh, the fact that you're willing to be a leader on that is tremendous, and we're excited to be able to honor you tonight. Thank you. All right, our next category is uh, children and youth support, and we'd like to ask Wayne Davis to please join us. So Wayne is uh, joining, joined by another rowdy group. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Project Ride. Now they do amazing things, and they, they uh, are always out in full force together, which is pretty cool. Um, Wayne was nominated by Susie Lawton for his work with Project Ride, uh, which is an equine, equine uh, therapy program for students with special needs. Uh, Wayne was, has served as the handyman, barn maintenance man, tractor repair guy, and their all-around Mr. Fix-It for more than four years. He also serves on their board of directors. Wayne is there to help with every fundraiser or event, and he's always on call. I know I've attended a lot of those events and seen you working really hard. Uh, according to Susie, Wayne has brought much joy and inspiration to Project Ride's families, volunteers, and staff. And at 80 years young, he has more energy and drive than uh, most of his younger colleagues. Uh, it, it seems to me that you know, Project Ride does amazing things in the community, and uh, you seem to be the glue that brings a lot of it together. So it's exciting for us to be able to nominate, uh, or, that you were nominated and for us to be able to award this to you tonight. So thank you for your service. All right, the next category is sports and recreation. I'd like to ask our winner, Sarah Schleschler, to please join us. Congratulations, thank you. Now, I need to tell you that Sarah was nominated in actually three different categories by three different people. That oh. says something. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I guess that says something about athletics, right? Uh, you know, you, she was uh, de really destined to be recognized this year for this award. She was nominated by, uh, in this category, she was nominated by Marissa DeSalas for her work with Project Ride. Uh, Sarah has volunteered for Project Ride, Pirate Island Partners, and Kasuna CSD to coordinate several events and fundraising projects. Uh, as Marissa put it, Sarah brings a little light into the room when she arrives. Seems like she did that here tonight. She's full of creative ideas and gives special events that extra something that make them, that make them truly amazing. She's helped make a big difference in the lives of hundreds of students with disabilities and will likely impact many, many more to come. You're a senior at Sac State, my alma mater, uh, and we'll see, you'll, you're soon going to complete your degree in uh, recreation, um, parks, and tourism, right? Um, so I think the fact that you are... You know, in college, but you're already dedicating your life uh, to serving others is pretty inspirational, and we want to thank you for your service.
last and absolutely not least, and uh, this was a tough one as evidenced by the fact that we had some honorable mentions this year, and that's our Young Volunteer of the Year. I would like to ask our winner, Abigail Carson, to please come on up. So Abigail was nominated by her mother, Amy, who has witnessed firsthand the significant commitment that Abigail has made to serve her community. Uh, you serve as the Associated Student Body President at Laguna Creek High School. Fantastic. Uh, you'll, you'll be sitting up there in a few years, right? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Obviously, anybody can do it. Because <laughs> I'm evidence, uh, no. All right. Um, I know that over the past year, you've amassed more than 250 hours of community service. That's amazing. I mean, I don't really, um, including you've been involved in Project Ride, Rotaries, uh, Interact, and also um, the volunteer work that you've done tutoring uh, struggling students, which that makes a tremendous difference. It really does. I, I know that firsthand. Um, you've been a passionate advocate against bullying, and you've been involved with uh, anti-bullying programs at your school. Uh, you obviously have a heart and a spirit for service, and perhaps even more commendable, you do all this while maintaining uh, an international baccalaureate level classes and a, above a 4.0 GPA, playing club and high school soccer and assisting her family. That's incredible. Don't know how you do it. I don't know if you sleep, <laughs> but um, chances are you probably don't. Um, but you are, uh, you are an example for uh, all all other young people in our community, and uh, we expect good things of you going forward. You know, you're laying a groundwork here in Elk Grove. We're uh, excited to be able to celebrate your service in the community, and we know that you're going to go along and do great things, and uh, um, truly, we look forward to you, you know, coming back at some point, being a part of this community, and leading us uh, forward into the future. But tonight, we get to celebrate your work and congratulate you. Thank you. So that, include, that concludes our awards tonight. Can we do one last round of applause for all the winners? One of the things, there, there were 25 different nominees that were put forward, and I want to give a congratulations to all those that were nominated, not those who just won tonight, but everybody that was nominated. Congratulations to everybody. Thank you. Well said. Uh, in addition, I really would like to highlight the work of uh, Kristen. You know, she's fairly new as a city employee, jumped right in, um, took this over, and uh, did a great job organizing uh, the committee um, and, uh, you know, the nominees and getting us information so that we can make this decision. So anyway, thank you very much, Kristen. I think she walked out. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to move on to the next item, which is public comment. And just as a reminder, this is the opportunity for the public to comment on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, to let you know, we uh, are unable to take action on items that aren't agendized. So if you have uh, something you would like to share with us, we can take it in. Uh, ask staff to get back to you or otherwise proceed. So, uh, and as a reminder, we ask that you limit your comments to uh, three minutes, and we do that so that everybody has an opportunity to participate. So we're going to open public comment here, and it looks like we have Lynn Jackson signed up first, followed by Tony Padilla. Good evening. Ah. Yeah, you guys just left... <laughs> That hurt. Um, I don't really have anything written down. I've provided you all with copies of photographs I took yesterday on the Shires, which is next door to me. I'm, I'm at 10201 Bond Road. Uh, we, my husband and I and the adjoining properties have been concerned over the years 
with the development on this property because the houses that are going in there average two to 3,000, maybe 4,000 square feet more than what the development had planned for in the beginning. And the drainage is a huge issue. There were swell, swales, I believe they're called, that were developed on the property to hold the water. Unfortunately, what they're doing is they're creating larger footprints on the property. And as you can see from the photographs I gave you, yesterday morning, I woke up at about 6.30 with truck and transfers coming in. And over the day, they added a mound that was four to five feet tall. Now, when they spread that out over a two-acre parcel, that's going to create an incredible amount of water coming down. And it's going to all get pushed off on the neighbors because the swales are not big enough to hold it. Um, I, I'm here tonight not to ask you to do anything about it. I know you can't. I just, my husband and I want to get it into the public record that we are extremely concerned about the impact, not just on ourselves, but on our neighbors. And maybe it's time that the city take a look at doing some kind of drainage out there because these million dollar homes in, going in there are creating a huge impact. Um, the conditions of approval that were originated when this was put into place. Some of them are being met, some of them are just being ignored. Um, the gates are a prime example, and I won't even get into that. Um, but something needs to be done to make sure that people who've been here for a very long time are not impacted by people coming in. I know these homes create a lot of revenue. Like I said, I know they're multi-million dollar homes, but I I don't live on a multi-million dollar piece of property, and it's just not fair that I have to get the impact from what they're doing. So I'd appreciate it if you guys would take a look at what's going on here. Lynn, Thank you I, very much. I have a, a question for you. Do you have any idea of what they intend to do with all that dirt? Is that for landscape features or? You know what? Um, I think that they're raising the whole level of the two acres because otherwise that specific plot will flood. It's at the back of the swale, through the back of, on the other side of my property line, there's a drainage, and it goes through the shires and out Bader. It goes through another piece of property to Bader. When they graded the shires, they graded a larger area for that water to go through, and then the swale comes down from the front of the property to the back, and right about where this plot is, is where it evens out. So I think for them to be able to build, even though there was already, as you can see from the photograph, there's already a, a, a bunch of dirt there for them to spread out. They created plots for each one of the properties. They added to that. And so is this dirt for the house that's under construction or, or it's for no, a separate it's going lot? No, it's going to be for the house that's under construction. It's for 9123 Shires Lane. Okay. Tara, we should make a look at that they're not violating their improvement plans. Yeah, we're, we're already looking into this. We, we had, okay. We've made aware, and so we have folks looking into it. Thank you. And then the other thing for you to do uh, proactively is, is make note of drainage conditions now since we're coming into the wet season. And then so that you can accurately, uh, yeah. if anything changes, because it's illegal for them to, to force know. drainage onto your property. There's already been drainage onto our property. We have filled in where it was sitting in the back, where they forced it back. We'll see what happens this year. Okay. I mean, I, I just don't know. Okay. Because we stand to lose quite a bit of land in the back if they keep forcing the water back on us. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you. You certainly are on the record now. I know staff's aware of it, and uh, thanks for bringing it to our attention. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next speaker signed up is Tony Padilla. Following Tony, we have Dr. Kelly Byam. Hi, I'm uh, Tony Padilla. I'm not related to Leonard Padilla. <laughs> I'm one of the Huntees. It's an important <laughs> clarification. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, Mayor Davis, when you were running for office, I voted for you. I think we got a good one. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, sure. what I want to talk about is this is a dangerous situation. 
Elko Boulevard and the, where the railroad crosses, some of those rails are loose. And when the train goes by and the set of wheels goes over, the rails go like this. I called you. I called you, but maybe they didn't give you the message. I called the chief of police. He didn't. He didn't get back to me. But you know, if a train goes by there with tanker cars hauling uh, acids or propane or anhydrous ammonia, and those tank tanks rupture, it could kill a lot of people. So I don't know who to talk to to see. I called the railroad three different times in the past year. They won't do nothing about it. Hmm. But it's a real danger. There, maybe I can talk to you later or sometime. Yeah, and for sure. And actually, I mean, you, you've now brought it to our attention. I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, sorry, you had to come here to to get this message delivered. But um, certainly, uh, we hear it. And um, so, Richard Shepard, our public works director, is going to, you know, have us taken a look at. And I can also, you know, I think we can we can help in getting Union Pacific's attention on it. Um, Richard, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I was just going to say, just by coming to the meeting and raising the issue, I'll make sure that we look at it and make sure it's safe. And uh, uh, I wasn't aware of anything at Elk Grove. I know that we have had some other problems down on Grant Line at the UPR crossing, and they've come out to repair those issues for us. So we'll get on this one, too. Well, I appreciate you noticing and bringing it to our attention. And may, uh, Richard, do you think you, you can exchange information, and then that way once we make contact or look into it, we can follow up with Tony? I'd like to mention, uh, to show you how concerned I'm about people. I live in San Jose, and uh, there, there used to be a McDonald's restaurant at the East Ridge Mall, and right outside McDonald's there was a newspaper machine, San Jose Mercury News, and I walked out of McDonald's, I was going to get a paper at the time, the papers were 35 cents, and there was three girls standing there by the machine. When I opened the door to get a paper, they reached in and grabbed the paper. I said, wait a minute. I said, these papers are not free. You're supposed to pay for them. And they walked like away laughing like they had pulled a fast one on, on the newspaper company. I fe even though the newspaper company was a multi-million dollar company, I felt bad that they stole a paper from them. I got 35 cents, and I put it in the machine for the paper they stole. We, we could absolutely use more people like you, Tony. Thank you. Um, all right, our next speaker we have signed up, uh, Dr. Kelly Byam, following uh, Dr. Byam, Lynn Wheat. Thank you for letting me speak. It's an honor to be here tonight. I know some of you already. I've seen some of you uh, in my practice. I work here and have uh, had my veterinary hospital in Elk Grove since before they were incorporated. So for over 13 years, I've been working on the west end of the city. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to speak to you today about a big, hairy, audacious idea. It's not on the agenda. I'm hoping it will be one day. I'm here to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. I'm here to speak to you for the animals. I believe it is time for Elk Grove to have its own animal shelter. For years, we have had to sublet our services out to other organizations, either Sacramento County Animal Control and Regulation or to the SPCA. And we've been at the mercy of those organizations and other entities. In that time, we have incorporated. We have our own animal control uh, officers who are fantastic but we only have field services for the animals. The animals that live here in Elk Grove have had to go to other places for their treatment. I can tell you as a veterinarian, and I'm the past president of the Sacramento Valley Veterinary Medical Association, we give free exams to people who come from shelters who adopt the animals. The ones coming from Sacramento County do not get the level of care that the animals get at the city shelter or at the SPCA. So what I know, come January 1st, the animals in Elk Grove that are lost are going to go to Sacramento County, animal care and regulation. I can tell you as a result, animals are going to suffer. Animals are going to die. The location of SCACR is more than 40 minutes away from the people who live where I practice. People are not going to go there. They can't get there. They don't have transportation. There are other cities in a small radius that are half the size of Elk Grove. 80,000 people that have animal shelters. I'm talking about Chico. I'm talking about Tracy. Our population is more than twice of any of those cities. I think it's time 
Elk Grove has shown it knows how to be a grown-up city. We're not a satellite suburb. We are a metropolis, and I would like to see us start acting like one. I believe we have the resources. We've already committed almost $3 million to the SPCA, who decided to just cancel our contract. And now we have to go to SCCA, SCACR. I know they will not provide us the services that our animals deserve and that our people deserve. If we have our own facility, I think that we can do right by our own citizens and by the animals. And I can tell you, I have a coalition of the commitment uh, co committed behind me that will help. I know the people who know how to do needs assessments. I know the directors of other animal shelters. I've been on the Blue Ribbon Committee that helped turn the Sacramento City Shelter around from doggy Auschwitz into a model of animal shelters. We can do it. We can do it cheap. We can do it efficiently. And we can do it better than SCACR. So, I would just like to put it to you, to put it in the back of your minds, willing to serve on any sort of advisory committee. I have people who are willing to help. We have the land. We have the resources. I think we have the people. And we have the ability to be a model for other cities in the area as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Byam, I appreciate your leadership and providing a voice for those animals. Uh, we have an item tonight, 10.2. And so when we get to item 10.2, we're going to hear a presentation. We'll be able to respond and have some conversation then. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our final speaker signed up uh, is Lynn Wheat. Good evening. Of all the council meetings I come to, I like this one the best because this is when you would give the mayor's volunteer awards and we get to see what's going on in the community and the wonderful people that do live here. And that's why at this point in time I continue to live here because it is about the people and my neighbors and friends. I just want to share this announcement. On November 6th at 5.30 p.m., LAFCO is going to be hearing the Elk Grove's Sphere of Influence application. For all the residents of Elk Grove, your attendance really does matter. Our city leaders believe we need 8,000 acres to bring jobs to our city. Have they proven the need for this additional land? Drive around Elk Grove, look at the undeveloped land and empty buildings, stores, industrial parks, office buildings. Many built have never been occupied in five years. Properties are now being subleased. Our leaders need to focus bringing jobs to these areas before sprawling outward and leaving areas within our city neglected and blighted, reducing our home property values. This is important because our council members have told us this is about long-term planning, planning 50 years into the future. When we've had buildings that have stood empty and vacant for five years, do we need to be looking 50 years into the future? No, I think we need to look at the next 10, 15. And 8,000 acres, 4,000 acres, there's not a need for it. This application's been all about greed. It hasn't been about need. For more information, I encourage you to look at the group Elk Grove Grass website. It's elkgrovegrass.org. And again, I, I encourage all those who sit in the audience that care about your neighbors and friends and family that live here in, in Elk Grove now and in the future to attend that very important meeting. This will impact us now, and definitely this will have an impact on the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Always value your participation. Um, all right. You are our final speaker under this item, so we're going to go ahead and close public comment and we're going to move on to item six, which is general administration information by our city manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I'd like to uh, give you a few reminders of upcoming events. First, uh, tomorrow night um, at 6.30 here in the Council Chambers, the Elk Grove Youth Commission will be hosting its fourth annual Teen Town Hall Forum. Uh, this is the Youth Commission's annual event to gather feedback from Elk Grove teens um, on local needs and issues facing the middle and high school aged um, uh, young people in Elk Grove. Teens are encouraged to attend and voice their concerns, but if for any reason they can't come but still want to provide their input, we do have an online survey instrument of questions um, that is available on the city's website. Secondly, the Elk Grove Police Department and the Elk Grove Commons Merchants are joining together uh, to host the 20th Annual Safety Fair and Halloween event this Saturday, October the 26th from 10 to 1 at the Elk Grove Commons Shopping Center, which is located at the corner of Elk Grove Boulevard and Bruce Hill Road. The event will include Radio Disney road crew appearances, a costume contest, and trick-or-treating and participating stores. Also, on Saturday, October 26th, the police department will partner with the Drug Enforcement Administration for National Drug Tape Back Day. 
Uh, this event provides a venue for citizens to dispose of unwanted and unused prescription drugs. Uh, again, it will be held this Saturday from 10 to 2 o'clock um, here at 8380 Laguna Palms Way. The drop-off point will allow residents to discard expired, unused, and unwanted medications for destruction. Lastly, um, we'd also like to remind you of the um, meet, upcoming meeting with the Sacramento County uh, Local Agency Formation Commission, uh, their, uh, uh, the meeting of November the 6th, uh, where the city's sphere of influence application will be heard. Um, this meeting will be held at Sacramento City Hall due to renovations um, at its usual location um, at Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. Um, LAFCO has released the final environmental impact report, and that report is available on the LAFCO website. Um, I have attached the uh, Standing Citywide Initiatives update, but frankly, there, there, are, uh, there is nothing new to report tonight. So um, with that, that concludes my remarks for this evening. Great. Thanks very much. Any questions for Laura? Okay. Well, let's move on to council comments, reports, future agenda items. Let's start uh, this side uh, with uh, Councilman Cooper. We had a regional sanitation meeting this morning, actually, and we talked about the, our rate increases for our water project. I know Mr. Hume is well, he a good report on that, so I won't steal his thunder. And didn't have air quality. I have air quality first thing in the morning. So that's all I have to report. All right, great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Detrick. Yeah, I attended several community events, a couple of highlights. Uh, one was the Strauss always puts together uh, great fundraisers and they had their Harvest Moon dance. And as we saw the uh, Lions Club here tonight, they they cooked the uh, cooked the dinner. And as, uh, we've all had dinners from Lions. It was a great, uh, great dinner and great dancing and uh, just a great event. Anybody who hasn't been to the Strauss Festival in the summertime out in Strauss Island, uh, you're, you're missing one of Elk Grove's treasures. And then today I had the opportunity to be joined with Councilman Cooper and Councilman Trigg at the Police Officers Awards. And it was for service above and beyond. And anybody who's here heard me speak about our Elk Grove PD, they are the most impact, impactful department we have in this city to the quality of life and the residents who live here so that we can be safe at home, safe at school, safe at work, just safe out in the street and in the parks. And uh, as was talked about, I know Mayor Davis has talked about recently, uh, we were just named the 35th safest city in the United States. So uh, goals be number one, Chief. And so uh, I know that's a tough task, but you know, you always got to shoot for the moon. But uh, again, congratulations to all those officers and your team, Chief Laner, for all that you do day in, day out. 365, 24-7 for that team. Yep. That's all I have. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Councilman Hume. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, at the STA meeting, which you'll probably uh, report on as well, we most of the meeting was an update on the uh, public outreach poll for the idea of putting a, a potential transportation and transit-related sales tax measure on the ballot. That will be conducted, I believe it was in November. So if you receive a phone call that wants to ask you a bunch of questions about roads and potholes and priorities, it uh, sure would be helpful if you could answer them. Uh, at the JPA meeting, we had an update on the Habitat Conservation Plan and also instructed staff to work with... Uh, uh, Sacramento County and our uh, city uh, on how we could put a partnership together to purchase some mitigation property. We delayed the approval of the plan of finance because uh, one of the members was not at the meeting. Uh, RT was short, uh, no, nothing of Elk Grove interest. And then at the uh, sand board meeting this morning, uh, the board voted to begin the Proposition 218 process of uh, informing the public of an intention to raise rates and essentially what they would go up, um, we're proposing $3 a month uh, for the next three years. Uh, and that's not every month. They'd go up $3 a month the next year, $3 a month the following year, $3 a month the following year. And again, that's to pay for the requirements imposed upon the district by the state for the upgrades to the uh, sewer treatment plant. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilman Trigg. Uh, yeah, I uh, would uh, mention uh, again the police award ceremony that I had the opportunity to attend today. It was very impressive. 
uh, I felt our chief of police made a wonderful presentation about the community, the depth of the community, and uh, the value of so many things that go to make us uh, a, a wonderful place to live. Uh, and uh, on the uh, uh, SAC Library Authority, uh, we meet tomorrow. So uh, that's all. Thank you. Uh, I just want to highlight one thing, uh, just building upon what the vice mayor uh, told you about. So every year the FBI ranks uh, cities in order based upon their crime rate in total, but they also break it down by a particular area, uh, type of crime. And of all the cities, 100,000 plus population, we rank 35th in the country, uh, but we rank top in the Sacramento region. And uh, just to put it into perspective, not that we're competitive with Roseville or anything, but Roseville was 70 and we're 35. Uh, I think that's something we all need to be proud of. Certainly crime is not at zero, and that's, uh, of course, our goal. But um, the Elk Grove Police Department works really hard, and they work really smart. And uh, our, our, you know, our street crime prevention unit, our uh, uh, patrol officers, our dispatchers, uh, everybody in between, the, you know, all the support uh, staff for the police, police officers and the police department and managers uh, led by our chief just do a really good job for the community. Um, but I'll also say, in addition, you know, we have a volunteers and police, police services program, the VIPs, VIPs, uh, which are people that volunteer uh, to patrol neighborhoods to do things like if you are away on uh, vacation, you can let the city of Elk Grove know and somebody from the VIPs program will drive by your house on a regular basis to check and make sure that there's, you know, nothing looks wrong. Uh, if it does, they'll investigate. Um, you know, we just have, uh, you know, in, in addition to our VIP uh, pro, uh, volunteers, we've got neighborhood watch programs in place. We've got just community members that uh, provide uh, active eyes and ears. So I think as a community, we all should celebrate the fact that uh, crime uh, certainly is uh, lower here than any other community in the Sacramento region. So just want to applaud our police department and the community for that statistic. Um, and with that, we'll move on to our consent calendar tonight. Let's go ahead and um, open. We're going to open public comment on the consent calendar. I've got one speaker signed up to speak, Beth Hassett. Hi, I'm Beth Hassett, Executive Director of Weave, and I just want to say how excited we are that the Domestic Violence Response Team is coming back to Elk Grove. We were so proud of that program when we were here before, and um, we're very sad to see it go away. And I applaud the staff that took the time to fill out the grant application and apply again and to successfully secure funding. When there's been an arrest or any kind of an intervention with law enforcement in a domestic violence situation, it's this critical point in time where victims are more receptive to receiving help. And by having somebody stationed here in Elk Grove who will call people after the fact and work with law enforcement to ensure that um, they are offered assistance, you're going to save a lot of lives and make sure that a lot of your citizens are much safer in their homes and out of their homes. So thank you so much for um, everyone's support of this, and we're very excited to work with PD on this. Great. Thanks very much, Beth, for your service, too. Thanks. Mayor, I just want to echo on Beth's comments, and this is, this is really important. We started, uh, obviously, our DVR team a while ago, and it stopped because of cuts, but everybody here has a mother or a daughter or sisters, and it's important. It does affect the community. It doesn't matter where you live at. It's ugly. It's behind the scenes, and uh, people need help, and they want that help. And as Beth said, uh, when the incident happens, that's some, actually the best time to get them out of that, and that's some action taken. So, you know, we appreciate all you do for Weave here across the region, and um, Thank you for being here in Elk Grove. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We're going to now close public comment because you are the only speaker signed up and uh, look for a deliberation direction and a motion on the consent. Oh, I'll move consent. Second. All right. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Let's move to our public hearings, uh, starting with item 9.1. And item 9.1 is three public hearings to consider the two annexations to Community Facilities District 2006-1, 2003-2, and the 20th annexation to Street Maintenance District 1, Zone 3I. 
Uh, good evening, Council. I'm Nathan Bagwell. I'm a finance analyst. Recently joined the team here at the City of Elk Grove. Um, Mayor Davis, uh, Vice Mayor Detrick, Council Members, Cooper, Hume, and Trigg. I would say it's an honor to come before you tonight and a privilege to work with such a great team here at the City. Uh, this is what I understand to be a fairly standard annexation. These are two projects, single-family residential units, both of them. They are annexing into the Community Facilities District's 2006-1 Maintenance Services, as well as 2003-2 Police Services, as well as the Street Maintenance District Number 1, Zone 3I. Uh, collectively, they will introduce $1,949 in new revenue to the city on an annual basis. And if you have any questions about these, I'd be uh, happy to field those. Mr. Mayor. All right. Yes. No, no questions, but welcome, uh, Nathan. And I hope Andrew warned you of how we dispense with finance analysts at the podium around here. So I'm glad to see you didn't put a lot of effort into a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, Mayor, great, you... great to have you. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, open the public hearing real quick. Um, so this, this public hearing is open. Let's open public comment, and we will close it because there's nobody signed up to speak. Let's declare the public hearing closed. I will move motion A1. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Let's get the results. End of two possible votes. Two affirmative votes were cast, authorizing the City of Elk Grove to levy a special tax at the rate of portion and describe. The measure passes with more than two-thirds of all votes cast in the election in favor of the measure. A resolution declaring the results of the special election is available for council consideration. Well, after that nail-biter, I will move motion number A2. Second. A motion and a second. All right. Uh, any further dialogue? All those in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? None? All right. And now motion A3, I'll move to introduce and waive the full reading by substitution of a title only, an ordinance levering, levying and apportioning the special tax and territory annexed to Community Facilities District Number 2006-1, Maintenance Services, Annexation Number 25, and Amending Elk Grove Municipal Code, Section 3.19.010. Second. There's the motion and the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Let's declare the public hearing for CFD 2003-2 open. Open public comment. I see nobody uh, rushing up to speak. So let's close public comment. Declare the public hearing closed for CFD 2003-2. I'll move motion B1. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Uh, City Clerk, let's see the results. Of two possible votes, two affirmative votes were cast, authorizing the City of Elk Grove to levy a special tax at the rate of portion and describe. The measure passes with more than two thirds of all votes cast in the election in favor of the measure. A resolution declaring the results of the special election is available for council consideration. I would move to adopt that resolution. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And finally, I'll move motion B3 to introduce and waive the full reading by substitution of title only, an ordinance levying and apportioning the special tax and territory annexed to Community Facilities District Number 2003-2, Police Services, Annexation Number 25, and amending Elk Grove Municipal Code Section 3.18.010. Second. All right, there it is. Our motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, unanimous. All right, let's declare the public hearing open for SMD 1. We're going to open public comment. No one signed up to speak on this item either, so we'll close public comment and declare the public hearing for SMD1 closed. If the clerk would please provide the results of the ballot tabulation. There is no majority protest of two possible votes weighted according to the proportional financial obligation for the two equivalent dwelling units. Two affirmative votes were returned. The ballot approves the proposed assessment and the proposed inflation adjustment limit described for the parcels identified in the ballot. Resolution determining to levy assessments in the district is available for council consideration. I'll move motion C to adopt that resolution. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Fantastic. Those, those were our public hearings for the night. We're going to move on to our regular agenda action items, beginning with item 10.1. Gene, Gene, you're Gene you are up. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Did, did, we hip, did we hypnotize you? <laughs> we did. <laughs> so poetic. Huh? Okay, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be before you again tonight to talk to you about the uh, transit RFP. We're here before you tonight to get uh, some feedback from the council on how to go forward with uh, a possible RFP for transit operations. 
Uh, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, we came before you with the short range transit plan. At that time, the council adopted the short, train, short range transit plan. That plan actually has um, sweeping recommendations to the uh, city's uh, transit system. These recommendations would require extensive contract modifications that are impractical to attempt in a contract amendment. Staff recommends proceeding with a new request for proposal that includes all contract modifications and allows the contract to be competitively bid. The modifications needed are listed on the slide. There are broad recommendations that would assist in producing an efficient transit system for the residents of Elk Grove. A new RFP would allow other minor changes to the contract that would further enhance the city's ability to effectively manage the transit operations contract. Currently, our current contractor is MV Transportation. The base term of uh, this contract ends on June 30, 2014, and has three optional one-year extensions at the discretion of the city. Staff proposes releasing the RFP in winter 2013-2014 and preparing a contract amendment with MV Transportation in the interim. An alternative option is to negotiate a contract amendment with MV that encompasses all of the changes that the RFP would accomplish. Tonight we are asking guidance from the council on the following allowing proposers to bid separate elements of the transit services or on all elements of the package. So that would mean bidding a paratransit, fixed route, and maintenance separately or could be combined as an entire package. Forming a subcommittee of the city council to serve in an advisory capacity during the RFP process. And lastly, using a best value scoring method weighted heavily towards cost. So at this point, um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have and also receive your guidance for proceeding. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, do we have questions for Jean? No. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to um, open up. We might call you back. So we'll see. But we'll, let's open up public comment opportunity. And we have Derek Kaloon signed up from uh, MV Transportation. Good evening, Mayor, Good evening. Uh, Vice Mayor, City Council, and the City Staff. Um, I'm Derek Calhoun from MV Transportation. I'm the Regional Vice President. MV is in support of the release of uh, the, uh, the RFP. And the reason being there's uh, several issues within the current contract that I think need to be fixed. We've been working uh, as a partner with the city to make sure that we deliver quality service and we will continue to do so. We also are going to make sure that we also are in the bid for the, for the uh, uh, project as well, too. But I think with all of the uh, changes that are wanted to be implemented by the city, it will be a cardinal change to the current contract that we have in place right now. So I wanted to, as a representative from MV Transportation, tell you that we support the release of the RFP. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Any questions for Derek? All right. Okay, you are the only one signed up. We're gonna, so we're going to close public comment. And uh, let's deliberate. Uh, Councilman Hume. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me just say I am uh, in support of the recommendation that staff laid out, uh, you know, serving on the RT board and also now on the paratransit board. I think the idea of separating out those elements uh, is going to provide for a more responsive bid um, from, from multiple agencies. I want to thank uh, MV for coming out and, and saying that. Uh, they're in support of this. I know that there are some issues they have with the contract that they don't want it extended beyond what it is. Let us get out from under it. So, um, and then finally, I would be willing to serve on the uh, subcommittee. Fantastic. I was taking that as a no <laughs> self-nomination anyway, so this is great. Thanks for your willingness to serve on that. Um, any other comments? Yep. Vice Mayor Detrick. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I agree, the staff recommendation. Uh, I'm glad Gene pointed out that uh, the cost is a, a huge factor in there in the best value because I know we went through that in the last go round where even though we were looking at best value I think there was over a million dollars difference in the contract so uh, keeping that in mind uh, we're not still uh, out of our tough times yet so money's definitely going to be a factor but looking forward to a best value I support the 
uh, staff's recommendation on how to proceed. And I agree with MV. Thanks for coming forward because that's always a question when you have somebody that you've been working with for, you know, it's been quite quite a few years long before this contract, the previous contract too. Um, you know, you don't want to have turmoil with your partner because we still have a minimum of till through next year on this contract. So thank you for coming forward on that. Um, I'll just add to it that, you know, I remember sitting down with representatives from MV, I think it was in 2007, um, and having a pretty candid conversation about the levels of service at the time. Um, and uh, from my point of view, they worked really, really hard and uh, turned it around. Uh, from a customer perspective, certainly, um, uh, you know, we used to get quite a few emails, phone calls about the, about just issues with service, part of growing pains, but, it, you know, in the city certainly, um, uh, you know, was going through that process as well. Um, but I'll say that now, I mean, the calls or, and or emails are down to almost nothing. I mean, I, you know, so from at least from that perspective and the times that I've written it, every now and again I'll, I'll write it in order to just kind of secret shop a little bit. And, um, you know, I've experienced good customer service by the drivers, experienced uh, good, good uh, uh, on-time uh, uh, stops too. So um, I do think that having the data available is important though. So this is, you know, I mean, this is anecdotal based on my experience um, and what I've observed and certainly the you know, emails that we used to get and the lack of emails that we get now. But I know there's a lot of other ways that people express concerns and uh, I think it would just be helpful for us to over time be able to look at customer service um, feedback, positive and constructive, <laughs> and uh, so that we can over time begin to see trends and, uh, and just continuously improve the level of service. So hopefully we can do that. And, um, and uh, you know, I appreciate uh, your willingness to move forward to the RFP. Um, so, what can we do? The can we appoint the subcommittee tonight? Sure, that'd be fine. That's on one of the options for you. It looks like you have one volunteer already. I'd, I'd volunteer also, unless somebody else wants to be on it. Okay. So we've got Councilman Hume and Councilman Cooper. That will it's fine with me. Okay, we'll serve on the subcommittee. Um, and then we have staff's recommendations. And uh, do you need a formal motion, or you just need guidance on no, this? No, direction's fine. And yeah. unless I'm mistaken, I think we have that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're good. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Let's move on to the next item, 10.2. Just a second while I try to find my PowerPoint presentation. Um, good evening, Mayor Davis, Vice Mayor Dietrich, Council Members. Maureen McCann, Supervisor with the Animal Control Unit. I'm here this evening to present the proposed animal shelter contract with the County of Sacramento. This contract, if approved, will begin on January 1st, 2014, and will be a five and a half year contract ending on June 30th, 2019. I would like to bring to your attention that this item does include two resolutions. For council review, if council approves the contract like with the county, the recommended changes to the current animal control fee schedule will also require your, your review for approval. I believe that each of you um, has been given a copy of the staff report, which includes the contract, both resolutions, and the current fee schedule, along with the proposed changes. I have put together two presentations addressing each item, and I would be happy to present those to you now at your request. If not, Chief Leonard, Lieutenant Young, and I are available to answer any questions at this time. Great. Uh, Vice Mayor Detrick. Yeah, I have a question. I was looking in here. If I understand this right, the last time this went out for RFP was 2011? That's correct, yes. And, and there was no responders at that time? None at all, no, sir. Is, 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 I'm not sure if you were here earlier. Uh, one of our local vets said that they had the ability to put something together. So is that something we could possibly consider if we have a local vet who's willing to bid on this project? I believe... I'm sorry. 
Okay. Let me take that on. Okay. Um, the reason that the request is before you to uh, dispense with bidding is we didn't want to repeat that experience from 2011 with no known uh, change in the landscape facing a uh, uh, end of services from SPCA at the end of the year. Uh, this contract that you're considering this evening has a 90-day out clause, and um, that's for any reason, a 90-day notice. And uh, I heard the same presentation, and if there were like a grassroots group or, you know, a profit, nonprofit group that we learned of that could make a credible uh, uh, bid for those services during that period of time, I, I think you'd hear us come back in front of you and say, hey, let's open it up. Uh, it, that's just not as we were preparing to face the end of the SBCA contract, an option for us. Yeah, but it's something we can, we can look at from here going forward, though. Yeah. I mean, I'd like, like to see that. I don't know what everybody else thought on. Yeah, and I know uh, we're going to hear public comments. We've got a few people signed up to speak. Some of the emails I've re I think we've all received are, um, are some concerns about the approach that, uh, I mean, it's not the approach, I guess. I should say the capacity that Sacramento County has uh, and what happens when they reach, you know, capacity, reach limits. And, you know, we have, a, we have a number of organizations, businesses, community groups that are focused on serving the animal population. And, uh, you know, for example, the Animal Rescue League, right? They're a no-kill organization. They house and shelter mostly cats. Um, and I wonder if uh, you can address that particular issue. For example, if they are full and they have to make a decision about, you know, what they're going to do with additional dogs or cats that come in. Um, do we have the opportunity to partner with community groups, veterinarians, pet hospitals, uh, to somehow provide uh, a place for those animals to go? Yes, we do, and to some degree we've already done that. Uh, Maureen can uh, add to it uh, if she likes, but the first uh, issue is when uh, the county... Uh, shelters at capacity, we will get a notice whether you know, it's typically either dogs or cats, but we will get a notice. And then we've already reached out to a number of veterinarians in the area that uh, for basically overflow capacity when we reach those points. Um, we would be very open to uh, similar contracts with any organization to provide that overflow capacity. Uh, but what I have to do is kind of go back to the beginning and uh, say that one of the other features of this agreement is a restatement of recommitment of uh, our partnership with the county to provide adoption services, spay and uh, neuter services, getting those services into our community to prevent, um, it, to the degree we can do that, the uh, population from even hitting that shelter to begin with. So that's sort of the long-range prevention. We have a shorter range thing that we think we do pretty well in Elk Grove, and that is, especially with the microchipped animals, mm -hmm. every effort is made to return that animal to the owner uh, to prevent them from ever getting to the shelter to begin with. And I can tell you from what I know these folks work as well, the chip is obviously the easiest way to do it. Even then, anything on that animal that identifies where it might belong, these guys make every effort they can to return that animal to the owner before it ever has to go to the shelter to begin with. So what I don't want to understate is our commitment to the front end of this, the prevention of uh, unwanted animals to begin with, a way of preventing those that uh, do end up in our custody from having to go to the shelter in the midterm. And obviously, uh, we do have some built-in over, uh, county over capacity, overflow uh, issue that we can deal with, and we welcome other uh, opportunities to provide that service. Uh, Maureen, if you want to add to that. No, I mean, that's perfect. Through our being, um, Bring Them Home campaign, we are committed, staff is committed to bringing home any animal that has any type of identification. Um, we will go ahead and attempt, make an attempt to go ahead and contact the owner. We will go to the residence if we have an address on file. If it's a dog, if we're able to go ahead and secure it in the backyard, we will return it if the owner isn't home and leave a courtesy notice thanking them for having their animal properly identified either through licensing or microchip and let them know because their animal was properly licensed in microchip, it was able to be brought back home. So we do make every effort possible to go ahead and not bring in animals into the shelter and reduce our intake numbers. 
Thank you. Uh, Councilman Hume. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank the Chief and, and you, Maureen, for making that last point there because that was the point I was going to make, which obviously the number one priority is to keep the animals out of the shelters in the first place. Right. And I think that our microchip program, even though it's somewhat controversial among uh, pet owners, um, I'm a firm believer in it, having had a beloved pet returned to me after about a 10-month hiatus where she was living in someone else's home. Uh, she never made it to the shelter, never got checked, but was returned based on her microchip. And so, you know, that's obviously the highest priority. And I think that, unfortunately, this situation uh, presents us uh, with where we just didn't have enough lead time from when what I thought was a fairly amicable relationship with the SPCA uh, and the notification that they weren't going to renew their contract. And so there's no way we could have ramped up to provide any kind of in-house or even uh, cobble together a, a community solution in the meantime. I just did an auction for the uh, county shelter uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they have about 14,000 cats come through that uh, facility in a single year. Um, some of them feral and, and not adoptable, but they do adopt out a lot of them. And so obviously, to the extent we can lessen that impact, even by, I think cats are much easier to uh, manage and, and, and house and care for than, than many other animals. So even if we could look at uh, doing that in the future, of, uh, uh, the city manager referred to it as a cattery, to which I replied, get thee to a cattery, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So if we, if we can look at in-house solutions in the future, I think that would be great, but I think we're just up against a, a wall uh, here. But I, I love the programs that we do to try and make owners more responsible, keep animals out of shelters, and do what we can do to encourage spaying and neutering to reduce the wild population. You know, Council Member Hume, I'm very glad that you brought up the feral program because uh, we have made great strides in that in the, in the last few years. And um, a... Reasonably healthy feral uh, is not going to end up at a shelter, and I'd like Maureen to talk about that really briefly because we have we have effectively stopped taking healthy ferals to shelters. We were granted last year um, a grant from PetSmart Charities that provided funding for our feral freedom and community cat program, and through that program, we're able to go ahead and take healthy stray community cats and or feral cats into the SPCA, have them altered have them ear-tipped in rabies vaccine, and then return them back to the area in which they were trapped from or um, the colony which they came from. Feral cats do not belong in a shelter component. They are an animal that um, cannot be adopted, um, will not stand a chance to go to any type of rescues, unfortunately, because of their behavior and temperament. They've been able to go ahead and survive just fine on their own, um, our previous way to address the feral cat population has been to trap the animals, and their ultimate, unfortunately, fate has been taken to a shelter and then humanely euthanized. Our biggest intake numbers are our cats, unfortunately. But through this program, we're able to go ahead and proactively look at how to resolve the problem through humane aspects of taking these animals in, addressing the overpopulation problem through proactive spaying and neutering, and then releasing those animals to stabilize the population back in the area in which they came from. And it's been quite successful. Since the program started in last year in October, we have serviced 102 community cats, and we have issued 453 vouchers through our Feral Freedom Program. And uh, just to build a tiny bit on this conversation, you know, something that's always uh, – I've always thought of kind of an inconvenience. Just, you know, we've had a great partnership with the SPCA, but there's it's such a long drive for a lot of our community, right? And then, you know, this is not solving that problem. And, um, you know, much like we used to have a household hazardous waste facility that was out of out of town, we part, you know, we partnered with the city of Sacramento, but people had to drive to drop off their household hazardous waste um, to roughly the same place uh, these facilities uh, are. Uh, but we're now building our own household hazardous waste facility. It's going to be open soon, and you know it, it, it can be part of the natural uh, growth cycle of a city when it makes good, when it makes economic sense. So I, I do hope that we can continue to look at this. Um, but the bottom line is, I think we need to do as much as we can in our city and and partner with the folks that really uh, uh, already have a stake in this. Uh, and the more we can do that's mobile, the more that we can do in partnership with the pet hospitals, veterinarians, and the uh, uh, even pets, the pet stores, and uh, uh, and also our service groups. I think the better uh, to provide a local uh, local connectivity point for uh, interaction with the county shelter. But we're, 
we're not done yet. We need, we have, we need to open public comment <laughs> here from the public on this. So um, let's go ahead and open it up. We've got a few speakers signed up. Cheryl uh, Bernstein is first, followed by Barbara Doty. Hi, Mayor. Ooh. Hello. Hi, <laughs> council members. Um, Elk Grove was founded 100 years before I was born, and I'm old. <laughs> cute, as the, cute as a button, but I'm still old as the hills. <laughs> anyway, uh, in 2000, we became an incorporated city. Since then, we were the one of the, we were the fastest growing city in the country. Unfortunately, the timing wasn't too terrific. Uh, now we've been an incorporated city since 2000. Our population is 170,000 and probably upwards of that. It, it's just amazing to me. We're an animal loving community that we haven't really tried to form our own shelter in some kind of way. Dogs and cats, if any of you love any of them, you know how pure they are. And you know none of them are here by choice. None of them. And with the slashing, unfortunately, of the uh, intact animal license fees, which I understand the reason behind that, but unfortunately, because of that, People that want to sell animals in Elk Grove are going to be probably more encouraged to do that because if they get caught, they're going to have to pay less money. But they don't have to pay taxes on, on those commodities. And I'm just afraid we're going to have so many animals running around that aren't going to have homes. And quite frankly, and um, I've been paying back to an animal that I had since he passed away in 2001. I have never, ever found a cat, well, certainly not a cat, a dog that had a chip in them because the, the bad citizens or the people that are, at the very best, some of these people are uh, bad citizens and at the worst, they're bad people. But we can't do anything to stop them, and we're going to have these animals that didn't ask to be here. And before I go, I just want to tell you I really do love living in Elk Grove. I came up here and I got married to my high school sweetheart. We've been together ever since, and we have a very good life here. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Thank you, Cheryl. And hats off for the new uh, release program with the cats, the, the trap and release program. It's fantastic. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, next up, Barbara Doty and Laura Delight is after Barbara. I'm Barbara Doty. I'm a volunteer with Sacramento County. I've been a volunteer there for 11 years. I also run uh, the Lap Cats Adoption Program. And we have an adoption center at PetSmart. We've been in there since 2005. We've adopted almost 1,500 cats, all from the county shelter. So in that time, if, if, you, if you think about the amount of cats we've adopted, it's, it's a, a pretty large amount. but when we take into consideration that Sac County took in 11,500 animals last year, almost 12,000, 11,500 animals, 4,000 of those animals left that shelter alive. 5,700 were euthanized, 1,100 were returned to owners. So I'm in the shelter on a weekly basis, sometimes two, three times, four times a week. That shelter is at capacity all year long. We have a few months where it's, it's not so bad, but right now we've got uh, 362 animals in kennel, and 388 is a full shelter. There's 148 dog kennels, 240 cat kennels, 388. If Elk Grove brings their animals to our facility, the euthanasia rate is going to skyrocket. And the reason the SPCA has left you is because they didn't want to euthanize animals because their numbers skyrocketed. People donate money to the SPCA because they, they are trying to be uh, no-kill. They're not no-kill. but um, So I think that I'm very opposed to 
Elk Grove coming on board to, to county, but I think that there could be a solution, um, maybe not building an animal shelter per se, but possibly opening the possibility for a, a storefront. So similar to what we do at PetSmart. But, but Elk Grove would have a, a presence, a community presence, and you could get a, a, a lease, a, a building like, you know, the Sizzler or, or something even smaller. And, and the, the community would be able to come there, and they could come for redemptions. They could come for adoptions. They could come. They could, all the volunteers you honored tonight, you've got hundreds of people that want to work with animals. Maureen told us that. We have a great, in Elk Grove, a great uh, volunteer force. They're not going to drive to Bradshaw and volunteer for the county. Why not have them here in your city? The Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, um, the elderly, the senior centers, it, would, it could be a place where people come like a Starbucks. You hang out with the animals, you could do your microchipping clinics, you could do your vaccination clinics, um, and, and it, it, you don't have to leave the community. You could bring Galt in with you. Have, have Galt come here. It's a long way for Galt citizens to drive to. So I would like to propose that. I know that you know we're coming to January, and, um, and I'm not saying county shouldn't help. We, sh we should still be a partnership with our spay-neuter efforts, but I think that um, having an option like a storefront would be uh, very progressive and lead you towards becoming your own uh, animal-friendly yeah, community. Thank you for uh, putting that on the table. Robert, thank welcome. you. All right, our next speaker signed up, Laura Delight, followed by Delise Ganaway. It's a lot more nerve-wracking up here. Um, hi, my name is Laura Delight, and I speak to you tonight not only as a lifelong Elk Grove citizen, but also as an eight-year volunteer at the Sacramento County Animal Care and Regulation Facility. Um, honestly, they're the two most important parts of my life. They're the avocation that I love and the thing that brings light to my heart and also the city that I was raised in. I remember when we were incorporated. I remember writing a paper when I was in fifth grade about it. It was, it was a big deal. Um, at our facility, I'm privileged to see a lot of astounding things. Among, of, among them are families being reunited with their furry counterparts. Um, children being allowed to adopt their first pets with their families, and abused animals getting just one more chance at happiness. What makes that possible is a tireless group of volunteers and staff, some of which are here tonight. Um, personally, I'm concerned how our already insurmountable workload will be affected by the 20, estimated 2,700 animals the shelter would receive, would receive annually from our city. As an Elk Grove re resident, I understand we do not have the facility to fully serve our community's needs at this moment, but I urge the council to invest time and money in finding a community solution as soon as possible. I conclude by thanking you for your time and consideration, and again, I appreciate the difficult position we were all put in by the SPCA's short notice. And uh, I look forward to helping work with you guys, with you gentlemen and ladies, um, towards a community solution. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Laura, thank you. All right, our final speaker signed up, uh, Delise Ganaway. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm a volunteer also with Sac County Animal Shelter. I've been there for a few years now, and I am also um, the co-director of a pit bull rescue in Sacramento. Um, my biggest concern is the number of animals that are euthanized. As Barbara Doty mentioned, the 4,000 animals that left our shelter last year alive, out of those animals, not all of them were adopted. I know our rescue alone took in 26 animals that were slated for euthanasia for medical reasons, um, which usually comes down to we didn't have the space to house them, to medically treat them. So that number is actually very, very low, and our space is very limited, um, and we don't have the volunteers to take in an additional 200 
plus animals to make sure that they are humanely cared for, meaning that they're walked daily. And I would like to see also the storefront that Barbara mentioned. Um, there, we've, I've been involved with some of the discussions with some of the programs that uh, the additional funds could bring to the shelter, which I think would be um, great for the community, for Elk Grove and for Sacramento regarding spay-neuter, microchipping, vaccinations, and so forth. And I think that would be a great partnership, but I am very concerned about our housing capabilities. And regardless of all those programs, if we don't have the kennel space for these animals, they will be euthanized. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time to come and provide, uh, I think, some good constructive solutions to be considered. So, um, there's nobody else signed up, so we're going to close the public comment opportunity here and look for some direction. Uh, Councilman Hume. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned prior to the public comment, I want to know I appreciate all of you coming out and speaking on behalf of, of those, uh, as you said, uh, animals that didn't choose to be get the lot in life that they find themselves in. Um, I'm a big animal lover here myself, and uh, again, I said the highest priority is to keep them out of the shelter in the first place. That being said, unfortunately, we're up against a clock right now that there's no way we can provide an alternate solution. So we, we can't have nowhere to take uh, the animals. Um, up until February 2005, the county provided that service. So I'm sure that with the help of all these great dedicated volunteers that we heard from, uh, they're going to have to figure out a way to make it work because we don't have any other short-term option. So I'm in favor of staff's recommendation, but I'm also in favor of providing, uh, figuring out s uh, something or, or workshopping some ideas. Uh, some of them have been brought forward tonight on what we can do to uh, find a little more permanent to uh, take responsibility for our own animal population. Great. Uh, Vice Mayor Detrick? Yeah, I agree. I'm in support of staff's recommendation as well. Uh, Kelly was up here earlier, and maybe she could be part of a team to champion since she's got the professional side along with all the other volunteers. Maybe it's something the city uh, with Maureen and her team could uh, put put together some meetings to, to brainstorm how to do this. But in the interim, as the chief says, we need to kind of get this done, get it rolling so we're, we're ready for January 1st. But then uh, if we have something that is uh, viable, with when everything's put together, then we can uh, pull back at that time. So that I agree with uh, what Councilman Hume said, and I think that's the way we ought to go. Uh, Councilman Cooper? Hey, this is a problem we're not going to solve overnight. Obviously, it's done by irresponsible pet owners. I think the mayor said it best. Uh, the time will come when it makes economic sense. It doesn't right now. You know, we talked about our bus, our, uh, our paratransit earlier. It's running at a deficit, significant def deficit right now. So you know, we've got to move people around and get them to work. And, Give them a doctor's appointments. So, you know, maybe a regionalism thing with, you know, Rancho and Citrus Heights. I know they use the county animal shelter too, I believe, or maybe the SPCA. And when this first started out, I was here in 2005 when we went to the SPCA to try and save animals and not have them euthanized. And that was a good effort. And it lasted for, you know, a good five years. So, uh, or actually eight years, I'm sorry, eight years. So it works. So now it's time for a new idea and for everybody to come together and brainstorm. Um, but I agree now is not the time for us to build our own shelter, but to look at it down the road and possibly do something. I think it's, we're a region that's, you know, in need, and regional, regionalism makes sense. Look, other cities similar to Elk Grove possibly combine with them. So I, the options are out there, just a matter of figuring out how to uh, solve this problem. So I do support staff's recommendation. Um, you know, it's tough. Um, we don't want to see any animals euthanized, but uh, right now this is our only move. And the fact is, it was put out there twice for bid, and uh, there were no takers. That's unfortunate. So there's only so much we can do, and hopefully through more education, we can stop this vicious cycle and at some point have our own animal shelter. But I, just the truth is, it's going to take some time. Councilman Trey, did you have anything to add? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, too, uh, agree with the, uh, uh, with the staff's recommendation. I... I've really appreciated the comments from the audience. Being uh, having uh, two dogs or uh, probably three dogs at one time or another over the 50-some years that I have been married, uh, they're a major part of our family. And uh, when I hear people speak, uh, it, it's from the heart. 
And I also believe that you can help us in the long range, both short range and long range, to solve a problem. I commend the staff for, I think, was a very realistic recommendation uh, and for the progress that, uh, that, that they have made. So uh, that's my feeling on that. All right, thank you. I'm going to one-up you a little bit with uh, a rescue cat, two dogs, a bearded dragon, six chickens, four baby chicks, and two goats. Uh, uh, Quim, <laughs> yeah. Quim. E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just <laughs> one thing. Uh, so, so we, you, Chief, you mentioned earlier that there's a 90-day out clause uh, if we were able to come up with another solution. Is there any early penalty payment if we did exercise that 90-day out clause? No. No, okay. there's not. Um, and then what I – so – I would like us to, in the short term, make sure that we have contracts in place with groups like Lapcats, Animal Rescue League, so that uh, if we hit, if the shelter hits that point where they're at capacity, that we have, that we can help provide some uh, resources to those groups to service uh, the animals um, while we're on a parallel track, bringing everybody together to come up with a solution. And I think uh, certainly we got a lot of good ideas put on the table tonight. They're not all identical, so I think it would probably take some time to work through them a little bit. But um, it's a good conversation for us to have as we set up the next next step, and let's let's see if it makes economic sense. We don't, you know, it might. You know. Mayor Davis, we already do have some of the, uh, call them overflow contracts with some veterinarians. We would welcome uh, additional proposals. Mayor Davis and Council, I just wanted to let uh, you and the public know that there have there have been quite a few discussions in our city county two by two meeting that the mayor sits in and Supervisor Natoli sits in and the uh, county executive office and my office, and we have discussed many of the ideas presented here tonight, and uh, particularly the storefront concept. That was something we talked about at um, at great length when we uh, met last week. Um, I want everyone to know that we have committed to work with the county staff to some to be a part of the capacity issue um, and, you know, to recognize that. Uh, we do have a problem with capacity, and we want to be a responsible partner to um, to come up with reasonable solutions. And you know, frankly, I think that does include working with the city of Gold and with the and and being a partner with the southern portion of the unincorporated county. Um, also, I wanted to let you and the public know that the contract that is before you tonight does allow the county to increase its staffing um, minimally by 1.5 FTE, but it, you know, it does provide resources for the county to, um, to increase its staffing because the, this um, area um, of, of county government has suffered quite a bit in budget cuts um, over the last several years and that um, the county staff throughout this process has been concerned about the capacity issue, and I believe that this contract with the county is responsive to that concern with the ability to, to call us to say we're, we're at capacity and we have contracts and solutions in place to deal with that um, uh, problem temporarily. So we understand uh, cap the, that capacity is an issue, and from a staff perspective that we are – very committed to help to be a real partner in helping to, to be a to bring solutions and be a part of, of crafting those solutions. Great, I appreciate this approach. Um, all right, so it looks like we need a motion. In a second. Okay, so uh, uh, I move staff's recommendation. We had uh, Vice Mayor Detrick seconded it for the two resolutions. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions. Okay, thank you very much. We have one last item tonight, item 10.3. Uh, we have a vacancy on the Historic Preservation Committee. Um, let's open public comment. There's nobody sent up to speak, so we're going to close public comment. And um, so we have a member of the committee that's serving as an alternate, Mason Matos. Uh, I would like to just move him from the alternate position to a, a voting position. Um, and then uh, appoint John Carlson as the alternate. I support that. Okay. All right. Very good. So that's the plan.
we are. Mayor, we, I, yeah. I do have one more thing I forgot to mention on uh, council uh, future agenda items. Okay. And one thing I'd like to bring back, obviously, with, you know, we've got our aquatic center coming up and some big city projects possibly. I would look, like, like to look at possibly having um, some language written in there where we have apprenticeship programs, obviously, with our, with our kids here to, to make sure that those programs are available for our children and a prequal uh, with some of our vendors just to make sure that they're squared away. Uh, the going to be paying a lot of money and doing a lot of business in the foreseeable future and talk about the benefits of possibly having some of those programs in, in place. So it would be an agenda item to, to take a look at what a program like that might look like? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I support that. I support bringing that back or yeah. to discuss it? I don't know. Did you hear what it was? <laughs> yeah. Uh, want a Band-Aid? No, no. All right. So are we, is there, a, I guess, is there a third vote to bring it back to consider it, to put, put it on the agenda so we can look at it? Yeah, I'll, I'll vote to discuss it. I'm not quite sure yeah. what we're talking about, but. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So maybe you can provide some uh, more detailed information to staff when it, for when it comes back. Sure. Thank you. All right. All right. Sounds good. Well, that's, that's all we've got tonight. We stand adjourned. Yeah, it's all right, I'm going to announce it on public.